Hello, hobby friends. I was recently commissioned to work on some Western gunslinging miniatures. Wait, not those Western gunslinging miniatures. These Western gunslinging miniatures. These minis are from a board game called Bantam West. To quote the Kickstarter page, An immersive sim adventure board game for one to four players. Play as one of four deadly strangers aiming to become the most notorious in the frontier. The sculpts of these figures are pretty amazing. They even come with these little chibi buildings. So cool. Can't wait to paint them. But I'll have to wait because there are mold lines. I'm not used to working on pre-assembled board gaming minis, so it took a little while to get used to mold line hunting on these sculpts. It was made harder by the fact that the mold lines are small and very well hidden, which is a good thing. In one case, there was a mold line on one of the legs, just a few millimeters from an in-universe seam line. Some people don't like mold lines in obvious places, but I think it makes them easier to reach when cleaning up. I also drilled a depression in the end of this guy's pistol. It would have bugged me if the gun didn't have a barrel. The other gun already had depressions molded, so it was good to go. The mold lines on the buildings were more or less completely invisible, except for the adobe ones. They had the proudest mold lines of the bunch. After a lot of scraping and sanding, the blemishes blinked out of existence. I would like to mention that any time I sand with a nail file, I periodically wipe it on a damp, folded paper towel. This removes plastic residue from the file while keeping dust out of the air. With the plastic prepared, it's time to prime. I start with a black prime from a Rust-Oleum rattle can. While I wait for the character's coat to dry, I hit up the houses. Back to the figures, I separate the curtain rod that they're mounted on so I can zenithal them in two batches. Three of them get a gray zenithal, while the other two are sprayed with a desaturated red from above. I chose different zenithal colors to try and mimic the warmth of the environment that each character would be in. The cabins get sprayed with colors corresponding to their respective characters. With the primer complete, it's time to get painting. Back at the painting station, I noticed that this gunslinger has a major mold line remaining on the arm. Fixing it is simple. The exposed area is in between the red and black, so I mixed dark red and covered it up. There! Looks good as new. I pop this guy on a painting handle, and start dry brushing a generic highlight all over to pick out the details. This will help me see what I'm painting in later stages, and it might even let me get away with translucent layers instead of time-consuming base coats. We'll see. I also brush highlights onto the adobe buildings in a similar way. Unlike with the figures and other buildings, these ones have large featureless areas that won't catch dry brushed paint. So I leave a little more paint on the makeup brush so it will deposit more easily. Apparently, I went too fast though, because I ended up stripping away uncured paint by going over it prematurely, creating a bald spot where you can see down to the primer. Because I couldn't work it into the script earlier, here's how I made the highlight color I used. Brown and a warm off-white to generate the value I want, and yellow mixed in to add some saturation. I think it looks good on the reddish-brown base coat. With the cabins partially done, I decide to put them aside until I'm done with the characters. That way, when I'm burnt out from the characters, only the easy part will be left. Oh, by the way, there is 2D art of these characters. From now on, I'll be referring to them by their names. These two on the bottom, Levy Mercer and Hannah Wilde, were partially cut off by my printer. But I can see enough of their art to get a gist for how to paint them. I start by glazing dark blue mixed from blue and black craft paint. Just in case you don't know, a glaze is when you extra thin your paint to make it more transparent. The zenithal and dry brush did a lot of work, but it left something to be desired in the shadows. After looking at the art, I realized that Hannah's light source is to her right, so I placed the shadows on her left and back side. The blue hue mimics ambient light, and helps those areas read as shadows without having to darken them too much. Mika Mankiller here is shown in a wooded area, so I glaze a bluish green over the whole mini so the shadow will look like it's illuminated by the light reflecting off of the foliage. For Jericho Jones, aka Little Cisco, I glaze purple mixed from blue and red craft paint. In the art, he's lit up from the front, so the shadow goes on the base as well as his back. 
skipping Levi, because his shadows are fine, I get to work on Ronim. That's what's written on the base, so that's what I'm calling him. He's a statue, so I'm going for a sandstone color. After the sloppy application of the midtone, I apply some sloppy shadows. I'm going to touch it up in a bit, so there's no need to be careful. Any surface that's even slightly facing downwards gets a shadow. I take that same desaturated blue shadow and thin it to a wash consistency so I can flood the letters of the engraved nameplate. Once I have it just right, I wipe away the excess with my finger, revealing clean, readable letters. With all of the environmental shadows in place, I dry brush the same desaturated warm highlight color I used earlier. I use a mostly top-down approach, with the occasional targeting such as the top of Cisco's calves, or the vertical ridges on Ronum's back. Here are three of them with the pre-shading complete. I like how the shadows differentiate them despite the unified highlight color. In Ronum's case, since he's a statue, he's pretty much done. Though I do touch him up with a few carefully placed shadows here and there. Moving on, I start work on the pants. A miniature's focal point tends to be around the upper half, so to help keep my sanity, I want to quickly knock out the less important areas. Since little Cisco's pants are black, all I have to do is darken them with a glaze of black craft paint. Levi's wearing blue jeans, so I... Whoa, that's way too bright. Let's wash that off. There we go. This darker, desaturated blue looks much more appropriate. Before I continue, I'm going to take a break and have a thematic snack of beef jerky. Mmm, don't mind if I do. And what goes better with jerky than raw spinach? Anyway, I continue by highlighting with a lighter version of the blue base color. I deliberately left areas of the pant leg, knee, and some parts of the lower leg untouched by the blue, exposing the pre-shaded brown undercoat. These areas are places that would probably be covered in dirt and dust, so it makes sense to keep them brown. Plus, it will help tie the jeans into the rest of the mini. You know, I just realized that his name is Levi, and he's wearing jeans. Mika Mankiller is also wearing jeans, so she gets the same treatment. A glaze of medium blue to preserve some of the pre-shading, followed by a less thinned, more opaque layer of lighter blue. Hannah here has brown pants, so I use my favorite brown craft paint. However, it's not the right hue, so I mix in a little red craft paint to tint it. I had some extra, so I use it on her hat as well. Her pants tassels, feel free to correct me in the comments, are already close to the color they need to be, so a little dry brushing and they're pretty much squared away. Now that the pants are done, let's move on to the shirts. Starting with white, the easiest color. I take most of the leftover blue jeans base color and mix it half and half with a neutral off-white. Wait, that's not white, that's gray. At least until I slide it onto Cisco's sleeves. Compared to the rest of the mini, it's pretty bright. And this is only the shadow color. Hannah Montana also has a white shirt, which is good, because that means I can alternate between Hannah and little Cisco. That way I can knock out the white without having to wait for it to dry. But instead of doing that, I switched to working on the stock of Hannah's shotgun. I thought that the stock had glossy vertical ridges on it, until I took a closer look at the art. Apparently, these are extra bullets. I guess that makes sense since uh, shotguns don't use magazines. Can you tell I'm not a gun expert? But to be fair, they weren't molded onto the sculpt, probably because it's a small detail that doesn't really matter. But it matters to me. Continuing with the white, I mix pure white 50-50 into the bluish-gray mixture I used for the shadow. Then I start highlighting Hannah's back folds. I, I, mean, I mean the folds of the shirt, yeah. I also get the spaces in between the tassels. Always remember to scrub in between the tassels. Though the shade of white is meant more as a mid-tone, it can be used as a highlight for the section in shadow. Then I mix in even more white for a highlight. This is more of a cool off-white at this point. I would normally like to use pure white as the final highlight, but I misjudged the values and didn't leave enough space for an additional round of highlighting after this off-white mixture. I have noticed that I tend to undershoot the values of my white. Despite that, I think the white turned out pretty good. The slight bluish hue in the shadows will help it contrast with the warmer colors, and as long as it's the brightest color on the mini, it should have no problem reading as white. Over his white shirt, 
Little Cisco is wearing a purple vest. I already gave him a purple shadow, but it's super desaturated. So another purple glaze it is, this time with miniature paint. Uh, whoops. I tried wiping and washing the purple miniature paint off the white sleeve, but it seems to have stained. Good thing white is super easy to paint, otherwise I might be a little upset. A little bit of white paint, and eh, it should be fine. I mix purple and cold red miniature paint together to make a magenta color, and spread this all over his vest. Once I have an opaque layer down, I wipe away a lot of the paint off of my finger, allowing the remaining magenta to mix with the moisture in the brush, creating a glaze I use to blend the magenta into the purple shadow. I often use this technique so I can get both opaque and transparent layers with a single brush load of paint. Now, if you closely look at the art, you can see a pattern of squiggly curved lines embossed on his vest. Using a highlight color, I start drawing my best interpretation. I've scaled up the pattern so it's easier to see from a distance. The fact that it's also easier to paint that way certainly doesn't hurt. Next, I glaze a base coat of light brown craft paint over Mika's jacket, followed by tan highlights. I reuse the tan as a highlight on her hat. Because I forgot to put down a brown mid-tone, I glaze one on, and finish it off with a stippled edge highlight to give a worn appearance. Not to be left out, it's Levi's turn for a base coat on his coat. It's a glaze of the same brown craft paint, this time darkened with black. While I'm waiting for that to dry, I might as well paint his shirt. Levi has a magenta shirt, so I'm recycling the same magenta mixture from Little Cisco's vest. I go back to the coat and highlight the sleeves with brown craft paint. When the shirt looks dry, it gets its own highlight. Then I finish off his wares with more highlighting on the back side of his coat. Wait, is that another mist mold line? Levi, why do you keep doing this to me? We've talked about this. Well, some simple sanding and a dark brown base coat right over the plastic. I'm sure no one will ever notice. I mean, my client sure didn't notice. The last bit of torso clothing is Hannah's red neckerchief bandana thing. Yeah. It's the most eye-catching part of the character art. So let's phone it in on the miniature with as few steps as possible. I'm using a translucent red craft paint mixture to take advantage of the dry brushed highlights from earlier on in the video. And oh boy, am I being careful with these tassels. I do not want to have to fix any white paint, not at this stage. I did get some red paint on the gun though. You know what? For a single coat of craft paint, this red looks pretty good. Okay, the clothing is pretty much done. Let's start on the skin tones. Now, Mika, Levi, and Hannah have very similar skin tones in the character art. To make it easier for myself, I'm giving them each the same skin tone, starting with a salmon color that you could achieve by mixing a yellowish tan into a red. I make a highlight color by mixing in more tan. Other than his mustache, which took some back and forth to get just right, Levi's face was pretty much straightforward. On Mika and Hannah, however, I ran into that problem that Warhammer Sisters of Battle players run into. It took me a while before I figured out that I needed to connect the highlight of the upper lip with that of the cheeks. I think they turned out alright. Much like Sisko's pants, I glazed some black craft paint over Mika's hair. Speaking of little Sisko, let's paint his skin. At first, I tried brown miniature paint. However, when I compared it to the art, I realized that I needed to drastically tone down the saturation. To fix this, I mixed a little bit of a dark gray of a similar value into the brown. I rebase coated the skin and highlighted with a lighter version. Unlike the other skin tone, I added shadows by glazing black craft paint. Also unlike the others, little Cisco has a bunch of tattoos. Well, this ought to be fun. I have no confidence and have never done miniature tattoos before. What could go wrong? So, Cisco has a triangular tattoo that I've drawn on the sheet of paper to illustrate how it should look. Here's how it actually looks. And here's a better, less grainy shot. It could be worse, but as it stands, he sort of looks like a Zelda fan with a Triforce tattoo. Hey, it's the cabins. Remember those? I, I, I still have to paint all of them. Starting with some dark blue shadows. Like before, 
The blue hue of the shadow will add visual interest that a monochromatic shadow just doesn't have. My client gave me permission to use artistic license, and since there's no art to the buildings, I'm just going to do whatever I think looks good while trying to keep them realistic. While those dry, I use the same dark blue on the barrels of Hannah's shotgun. And while I wait for that to dry, I fully paint Levi's pistol. I tried for a non-metallic metal, but it looks too chrome to me. So I smothered it in black craft paint and wiped it off the highlighted sections. The brightest highlight is reintroduced, and now it looks like a shiny gunmetal. I recreated the effect on the shotgun. It does look a bit weird if you look at it head on with those double highlights, but it reads as shiny metallic from either side, which is how you'd see it from most angles anyway. On the topic of metallics, I also hit up Little Cisco's belt buckle. The minis are basically done, except for the bases. Let's start with the easiest base, Levi's Desert Base. No need to base coat this base, it's basically already half done from the pre-shading. I glaze green craft paint to make patches of grass that are separated by churned up earth. Little Cisco's gets a bit more attention. Since he's illuminated from the front, I glaze light brown craft paint on the front edge of each ridge in the midnight desert sand. Then I finish off these bases by dry brushing khaki. It fits perfectly on the dry desert dirt, but it also works on the other bases. You'd be surprised how many colors can be highlighted with a khaki dry brushing. On Cisco's base, I make sure to dry brush backwards so I don't accidentally brighten those purple shadows. Back to the buildings, I basically do a bunch of crap to them until they look good. Dry brushing, overbrushing, any technique that layers on a quick gradient. Um, so I painted these ones white because I thought they were teepees, but after I dry brushed them, I realized they were made of wood. I asked my client what color they should be, and they messaged back, saying that they were made of white pine and included a picture from the Bantam West game. So I mixed brown paint into some Vallejo glaze medium. In case you're wondering, glaze medium does not let you glaze with your paint as far as I can tell. What it does do is turn your paints into contrast or speed paints. With this, I was able to give a brown tint to the almost white wooden cones with a very uniform coat. A little more dry brushing, and it's pretty much perfect. I round out the cabins by picking out details such as the tops of the chimneys, the insides of the windows, and the cute little cacti that the adobe structures have. Finally, the part every miniature painter looks forward to, painting the base rims. Bantam West does come with colored plastic base rims that you can clip onto the minis. I don't have those, so I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way. Ooh, can't forget to paint the tops of the rims. Even the cabins get to join in on the fun, as each one has a flag that corresponds to one of the characters. Uh, wait, how am I supposed to get the sticky tack out? Oh, that was easy. On to the glamour shots. These miniatures look amazing. They are definitely the most realistic minis I've ever painted. And that's not a credit to me. Every single color I used was pulled from the character art, which looks fantastic. Combine that with the excellent sculpts, and you have a recipe for success. I've attempted miniature box art before, but this is the first time I've used two-dimensional art as a reference. And I think I improved as a miniature painter as a result. Phantom West will be available next month. Link in the description. Here are the paints I used. Thanks for watching till the end of the video, and have a good one.